Hello, and welcome to Speaking Our Minds, Artists, Racial Divides, and Cultural Inclusion. I'm Phyllis Rappaport, Chair of the Boston-based Rappaport Foundation, founded by my husband, Jerry, in 1997. For those of you unfamiliar with our foundation, we reward artists who demonstrate compelling talent and the promise of future growth through an annual cash Rappaport Prize given by the Decordova Museum. We also partner with Harvard Kennedy School and Boston College Law School to help faculty, graduate students, and practitioners improve state and local governance in every arena. We endow scientists at three Harvard hospitals to find therapies for neurologic diseases and mental illness. And we co-founded Cure Alzheimer's Fund, a prize-winning public charity which funds groundbreaking research to end this disease. But today we are privileged to have a conversation with four terrific Rappaport Prize recipients. Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, Sonia Clark, Sam Durant, and Danielle, Daniela Rivera. Each is a creative force and visionary. Together, they represent the rich diversity, which has always been a trademark of the Rappaport Prize. From Tennessee, Massachusetts, and Germany, they join us today to showcase how their art reflects on our social and political stories and on their own personal histories. Our moderator today is Sarah Montres, Senior Curator and Interim Artistic Director of the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum. Sarah has a PhD in Modern and Contemporary American Art from New York University. Her recent exhibitions and research have focused on spirituality and activism, feminist art history, and the intersections of art and the scientific imagination. Sarah's current De Cordova exhibit, Visionary New England, explores the legacy of utopian activity in this region and its impact on contemporary art. It features several pieces by Sam Durand. Thank you, Sarah, for leading this important conversation. Let me hand things over to you. Thank you, Phyllis, and hello and welcome. I'm Sarah Montross, um, Interim Director, Artistic Director, and Senior Curator at the Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum, which is part of the Trustees of the Reservations, a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving natural, cultural, and historic places across Massachusetts. I want to extend my deep appreciation for the Rappaport Foundation's clear-eyed mission and support of contemporary artists and social justice among its many causes. It is a testament to the Rappaport Foundation and its longstanding partnership with De Cordova that we bring together such a powerful assembly of artists today. In fact, this program marks the 20th anniversary of the Rappaport Prize, marking its indelible record of supporting artists with strong New England connections, including this year's awardee, Sonia Clark, who joins us today. So congratulations to all, especially to Sonia. Our panel today features artists who are dedicated to collective um, and creative action toward dismantling systemic racism and fostering solidarity and communal change. Their work acknowledges the massive rupture, violence, and enduring toxicity of colonization and slavery. And yet at the same time, they strive for restoration, inclusion, and the inheritance of diverse cultural values amid upheavals and migrations. And we have asked the artist, each artist to complete really an impossible task to speak for just five minutes first in which they will reflect on an artwork or project of theirs concerned with social justice, justice and inclusion. Some of their projects are from several years ago, others are most, much more recently created, but, I, but through each I hope we will better understand concrete ways in which our most committed artistic voices bring attention to the complexities and contradictions of racial division and cultural belonging, and the ways in which they also reveal institutional tentacles. Following their presentations, we will have conversation among us to draw out connections across their projects and to reflect on our current moment. 
We do welcome questions and comments from you, the audience, which can be submitted through the Q&A function throughout this event. And I see many of you are also chiming in through the chat function, which is wonderful to, to hear you and see you. Um, however, given this short period of time that we have, you know, just a lunch break, really, we will not likely to be able to address each question. Um, but without further ado, please let me first introduce our um, first speaker, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, and then I will share my screen and move over to a PowerPoint for each artist to um, speak about that, their specific work. As many of you may well know, Magda is a galvanizing force of nature whose work often concerns migration, exile, and longing as told through her personal lens of Afro-Cuban belief systems and hybrid cultural identity. She is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Endowed Chair and Professor of Fine Arts at Vanderbilt University. So just a minute as I um, share my screen. Thank you, just a second. To Magda and now. So thank you, Sada. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you to Phillips and thank you to the trustee organization, the Rappaport Foundation. And of course, uh, the Rappaport Prize in itself since being one of the beneficiaries of such a wonderful uh, prize. I am uh, speaking to you all from uh, Tennessee uh, the land of the Shawnee people and Cherokee people, and also a city that was so important in the awakening of the civil rights movement in America. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge that before I start. And also, as I speak to you today from the side of Vanderbilt, I want to express my solidarity and my concern by the events taking place in Havana in the last few days in which a large number of young artists has been taken to stand in front of the Minister of Culture in Cuba and really speaking loud about the rights and the necessity to open a dialogue that is inclusive and expansive in the country. Uh, I also, in my conversation uh, here, started to, uh, to show and maybe introduce first one of the more recent projects that I have been involved. In the question of this conversation about racial inclusion, justice, and institutional framework, I want to say first my gratitude to all the institutions around the world. They have been inclusive of my work and my ideas. And also the three uh, projects that I'm going to show are in some way contestatarian response to institutional framework. I want to express that it is, there has been from the understanding and, the, and a space of gratitude of the, the opportunity the son of this institution has placed that I have managed uh, to raise my voice with some critical, uh, we'll say analysis or some critical ideas about what I saw that was needed in a particular time. I have been exhibited for three times, I believe in the Havana Biennale, an important uh, exhibition that started in 1984 in Cuba and that opened the doors for the idea of contemporarity for artists and projects outside the realm of the what we call only the West. It was the biennial that opened the doors to the global South and many other geographic latitudes and longitudes in the planet. Uh, in the in year 2019, 18, I decided that my invitation to the Biennale should not have been only about exhibiting my work, but to put in a, a place of visibility to a city larger inhabited in Cuba by black Cubans, a city of an extraordinary cultural force, but also they have been sidelined as in many places in the world uh, about periphery within the same structure of the nation. Um, so in this conversation of a center and periphery, but bring it to the regionality and locality of Cuba itself, I was um, uh, proposing the idea that the conversation of art in Cuba could be much more larger than just Havana and that could attempt to, to open doors and windows of conversation and opportunity to other sites such as Matanzas. So Rios Intermitente, this uh, image that you see in, was a, 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 a song, I would say, and a challenge to really be inclusive of artists that have never been invited to the Havana Biennale because they periphery within the country. And also to open that harbor that is Matanzas who is what's called the so-called Atenas de Cuba uh, to the world. So I invited 
artists from 28 countries, and I invited 25 um, uh, black, uh, mostly uh, Afro, this Cuban descended, to participate in this Biennale. Uh, it's important to mention why Matanzas was important and why this particular image of this boat is important. I born in the middle of the Cold War, uh, and as anybody that in Cuba born in that period, uh, being in a boat was a very rarity occasion in Cuba. The, the fear of Cuban living in a boat to the near shore of uh, Florida has been a contentious, contentious topic in Cuba. Matanzas not only is called the Athens of Cuba, but also the Venice of Cuba, and three rivers cross this city. So one of my projects was invitation for a performance in which the river of these rivers were open for local Cubans to have the opportunity for the first time in my lifetime to see the city from the opportunity and the leisure of a boat. Uh, there are many more images within numerous performance, and this is artist Jana Harper from Tennessee performing in Montserrat, a beautiful spot in the in the heel of the city, but also through the city of Matanza with a piece that was called uh, charging or hanging or, or moving something very heavy. Uh, could, that could be uh, a, a metaphor to so many scenes. And then I jump to gas. We move in from 2019 to 2004 to the opening of Gallery Artist Studio Project in the delightful and wonderful city of Brooklyn, the town of Brooklyn, my hometown for almost 21 years. And in and the intersection of Rue Night and the Rue Night across the country and, and Cypress Street in the heart of Brooklyn, I opened this tiny little gallery that was a, what I call a mom and pops uh, venue. Here is um, um, the wonderful Elfa, Elsa Dorfman, this modern uh, figure of the Polaroid camera visiting the gallery. And in the next picture is, uh, I see Mariela Strong, I see uh, Jeannie Chambers, I see John Rotter, I see Jennifer uh, Rush, all these amazing people, Karen um, Moss, so I, this was a gathering of a contract to the commercial gallery system in Boston and the institutional uh, frame of Boston. I believe that I was the, no, I'm going to say the first, but one of the first uh, African-American women to ever open a gallery space in Brooklyn, nevertheless, Brooklyn, nevertheless, Massachusetts. And this become a hub. I, so if we move to the next uh, um, um, image, uh, then we move to my most recent um, project, Engine for Our Democracy and Justice at Vanderbilt. In the Engine for Our Democracy and Justice, uh, I was trying to create a response uh, both to the locality of Vanderbilt, to the history of this city of Nashville, and also what we, and I'm not saying we, but maybe better than anybody else, um, uh, Achille and Bember have called the Planetary South and the, part, the, the stories and the questions, the narrative and the inquiries that are pertinent to us here in the South of America, in Tennessee, could be actually heard and repeated and founded in many other localities of the planet. So uh, Engine for Our Democracy and Justice, which for what I invited as a guest um, a curator of program for the first iteration of it, Marina Fokiris, uh, the launched an, an editor uh, of South Magazine, who was actually the magazine that launched several platforms for Documenta uh, 14 as a guest curator. The guest curator will be uh, changed over seasons and we are starting in, sec in, in September, uh, sorry, in January 2021, the next uh, uh, edition of the Engine for Our Democracy and Justice. Quickly here in the first episode, we I, I don't want to mention the name, but uh, artist Hans Willis Thomas, uh, curator Monica Sedgwick for, from um, Amsterdam, professor uh, uh, Kevin Murphy from Vanderbilt, uh, and many others that are familiar with you in the world participating as well, Marina Fokiris. Uh, we have invited serious speakers from the entire global south to this uh, um, a festive online of criticality and analysis. And we uh, departed from a conversation of a 
the South as a place of a precariousness, but also as a place of a finding and, and, and encountering possible uh, venues or, or path of answers to many of our pressing problems. So locating three projects, one in the south of Boston, Brooklyn, actually, that gallery was located in the south part, almost the south part of Brooklyn, Yes, uh, Intermittent Rivers, Matanzas, and uh, Engine for Art, Democracy and Justice. Uh, this, the link between these three projects is um, the voice of myself as an artist, but also my voice as a, an activist, a civic citizen engaged and concerned with responses and opportunities for engagement, not only of a discourse that is stay within the art, but expand outside the art and integrate it with society in a dimension that I think is fundamental for our times. Even with these three different experiments, take a very complex set of circumstances and geography, what brings to them together is the presence of the voice of an artist that have broke away from the idea and the constraint of the artist in the studio, uh, arguing and suffering just with self. But what I believe that is part of the future of art, what is when the artists take really with full hands, the consequences, the implication, the possibilities and opportunity to be a thinker and, and an experimenter of, uh, of his own, her time. There is no one issue that was important to our current circumstances. There were no explore or brought to attention in each of these three projects. So thank you. And this is what I have to share for the start this conversation. Thank you, Magda. It's so clear how much you are a galvanizer of creating a community um, in everything you do with your work. And so I'm sorry to cut you off and move on, but we'll, we'll return to these conversations um, soon after our presentations. Sonia Clark is our next speaker. Um, she, Sonia, um, as many of you know, knits together fiber art social and, sorry, and social practice to probe and honor the roots, excuse me, are you still, oops, looks like my screen, um, to, to probe and honor the roots of racial and national identities. Her tactile communal work often literally brings together to brings us together to hold difficult conversations on topics ranging, ranging from the legacy of slavery to practices of policing and incarceration. Clark is professor of art at Amherst College. So um, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, planning and serendipity and ancestral influence brought us here and I'm deeply grateful to be with my kindred Rappaport Prize recipients and the hundreds of you listening in. I keep seeing so many names of friends and former students um, in the chat. So hello to all of you. So when I was asked to introduce one project in five minutes, any of those of you who know me know that this seems like an impossible task. I have dozens of these beloved grown children. So how to select just one of them to represent all their personalities and all the things that they have taught me. Um, so instead, I've elected to share with you a newborn, the Solidarity Book Project. I ask you to hold it and be part of its upbringing. My team and I launched the project weeks ago during Native American Heritage Month, and we're rolling out calls for your participation through the month of February, that is to say Black History Month. So the project is bookended by November, from November ending in February. And so the, to this task of five minutes, my extemporaneous speaking mimics the curl pattern of my hair. It is at once recursive, resistant to gravity and hard to contain in five minutes. So I have notes that you can see I'm reading and a short video on the Solidarity Book Project that we'll share so shortly. But first, a few things about the project. Participants in this project will collectively define solidarity. Together, we'll stand against the brutal legacies of settler colonialism and white supremacy that live on and on in the long, endless moment of this now. As a book project, 
the project centers the power of text to shape thinking. As an art project, it shapes the physicality of books into iconic forms. The project turns these collective actions into funding for Black and Indigenous communities. At this germinal stage, we're partnering with my institution, Amherst College, as we sow seeds towards restorative justice amidst the current chapter of National Reckoning. So I invite you to Google the Solidarity Book Project to participate and spread the word. You see all of the social media handles there and the website. And Sarah, I'm going to turn to you to start the video. Thank you. Second, read a passage from a book that taught you something about solidarity. Maybe it's a work of fiction, maybe it's an autobiography, maybe it's a book of poetry, a history or an economics book, maybe it's even a cookbook. Hopefully, it's a book by a Black, Indigenous, person of color, or an ally. Another way that you can participate is by taking one of those types of books and book sculpting them with the iconic Solidarity Fist. We have instructional videos to show you how to make these. Now, if it feels strange to take a beloved book and manipulate it in this way, we're encouraging you to buy a second copy of that book. But when you buy that second copy, please buy it from a used bookstore, an independent bookstore, or a Black, Indigenous, or person of color owned bookstore. And in that way, you can exercise some of your solidarity as well. We're going to gather up all those recordings and have you send in those books and they'll be displayed in an exhibition that will take place in the fall of 2021 on Amherst College's campus. For all of these participatory engagements, Amherst has pledged to give money to underserved Black and Indigenous communities by bringing them book knowledge. Here's how this project came about. Amherst College approached me to make an artwork to commemorate its bicentennial. And I couldn't, in good faith, make an artwork like that without first acknowledging that the college sits on land that was stolen from our Indigenous brothers and sisters. So the solidarity begins there. Also, the bicentennial intersects with the fifth year anniversary of the Amherst Uprising, which took place on Amherst College's campus in the Frost Library. It's also an intersection with the 50th anniversary of the formation of the Black Studies Department at Amherst College. So all of these things are coming together. When the exhibition comes to a close and your books get returned to you, then that book might become a seed for an institution in your community to think about how it might use an action similar to this, to do its own reparative and restorative justice. In that way, the Solidarity Book Project becomes a replicable model. Join us. Your participation is an effort in exercising our solidarity. Thank you, Sonia. Um, next up, we will hear from Sam Durant. Sam Durant directly confronts the inequities of racial dynamics of American society and creates politically charged artworks that often expose less visible, yet no less foundational episodes of our country's past. Based now in Berlin, he is faculty at the California Institute of Art. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, thanks uh, to the Ravaport uh, Foundation for their support, and um, to all of you for putting this panel together. Very uh, interesting and uh, fascinating group of artists, so I'm happy to be here. Um, I lived for, for 30 years in Los Angeles, and uh, 
One of the first works that I did um, dealing directly with the issue of race, <clears throat> racial justice, racial injustice, um, and particularly the geography of race. So the spaces that, um, the spatial segregation that most places in the US still suffer from, and certainly in Los Angeles. Um, this was a big issue back when I did this piece 20 years ago. Uh, I was invited um, to be part of an exhibition at a historic house, the R.M. Schindler House, which is in West Hollywood, California. Schindler House is one of the most important uh, early examples of modernist architecture in America. Uh, it was built in the very beginning of the 20th century and has be since become a, uh, a site for visual art exhibitions, music performances, and a, sort of a, a cultural center um, for uh, experimental and avant-garde culture in Los Angeles. Something it was um, when Schindler first built the house for himself and his family. What, what, I, what I was aware of at that time was the, um, uh, the incredible uh, spatial segregation in Los Angeles. And uh, South Los Angeles, which is uh, at that time was primarily African-American um, because of all the discriminatory housing uh, rules and regulations, uh, redlining the practices that banks and um, loan making groups uh, used to exclude African Americans from certain neighborhoods uh, created uh, South Los Angeles as a largely uh, black area of the city and excluded them from places like West Los, West Los Angeles, which is um, primarily white and very wealthy. Rudolf Schindler, um, if you could, it, I, I just comment on this, this image. Uh, there's a sign on the facade of that house, um, which is a, uh, a, a Bible verse, adventure into faith for, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Um, and that's a reproduction of a sign uh, that I found on a church in South Los Angeles, the Bethlehem Baptist Church. Sarah, if you could go to the next slide. This is the Bethlehem Baptist Church in South LA. Um, in, uh, I believe in the late 1940s, uh, the pastor of that co congregation in, in Los Angeles, an African-American part of the city, and in, in the 40s, of course, this was a strictly managed, uh, racially segregated city. Um, they didn't have Jim Crow uh, as a kind of legal system, but it was practiced um, in effect, de jure, so, um, or de facto, I should say. So uh, this was an interesting uh, intersection where an avant-garde uh, modernist architect was invited by a black pastor to design a modern church for his congregation. Um, and, and so this became the first and only building in the city of LA designed by uh, one of the city's celebrated uh, modernist architects. Um, and when I, when I came across this building, um, doing my research on Schindler, um, I saw that it was really quite unknown uh, in the city, uh, whereas some of his other buildings were celebrated um, uh, and very well known and on architectural tours and so forth uh, and in all the guidebooks. And, um, so what I thought was to connect these two uh, institutions, um, in, in a way each kind of functioning as a gathering place for a particular community in the neighborhood. Um, each a place where people go to share um, and connect and uh, be with like-minded folks. So I saw, the, I saw the church and the, and the Schindler House as a cultural center operating in similar ways in, in these very segregated communities. Um, so what I did is I made a copy of one of the signs that you can see on the, on the corner of the church and put it on the, on the house, on Schindler's house in West Hollywood um, in order to kind of 
uh, draw these two uh, buildings together. And then I put together um, a program, a public program of um, looking at modernist design in parts of the city that most of the people in the art and architecture world never go to. Um, and I organized tours and brought people to see the Bethlehem Baptist Church and many other interesting sites in South Los Angeles while trying to connect with some of the organizations in South Central, um, uh, the cultural organizations, particularly the um, Cultural Center at the Watts Towers to bring uh, people from their constituency uh, to the Schindler House and introduce them to the Schindler House. So it was an attempt to sort of um, not do anything too, um, overly organizational or formal. It was all very informal and it was meant simply to introduce people to each other <laughs> and to create a, create a situation where people were getting together. I think one of the most important things we can do to overcome um, racial prejudice uh, um, and uh, um, imbalances and so forth is just to be together, you know? Um, it, it, proximity is, is one of the most important things that we can do just to get to know each other and to be comfortable with each other and to see that, hey, actually, we're all human beings. <laughs> um, and, and I think this is something that, that has this project that I did in 2000 and 2001 is something that um, I, I have built on um, going forward through much of my work, including the project that I did uh, a couple of years ago in Concord, Mass, called The Meeting House, that some of you may be familiar with. So um, thanks for the opportunity, and hopefully we'll talk more. Thank you, Sam. It's fascinating to learn about um, one of your earliest, one, an earlier project like that. Um, Daniela Rivera is our, our next and final speaker. I'm delighted that she can join us as well. Daniela Rivera is best known for her ambitious architectural installations and paintings that probe issues of labor, repression, and displacement. Yet out of these dark topics, she brings about joy, pleasure, and mystery on an architectural scale inviting viewers to dwell in these conflicted spaces. Rivera is Associate Professor of Art at Wellesley College, Daniela. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to the Rappaport Foundation, the trustees, and to the amazing team that put this panel together. And to my fellow panelists, I'm such, it's such an honor to be included in this group of artists. Um, I'm going to proceed immediately to talk about the, the project. I had a whole thing prepared and to contextualize, of course, and now I'm um, actually not going to do it um, for the sake of time. And also, um, I think it's unnecessary. It will come in the, in the questions, hopefully. Um, Sobremesa, I'm going to talk about Sobremesa, a project that was installed for two months um, in Grove Hall neighborhood in Boston. Um, Grove Hall is in the intersection of Roxbury and Dorchester is really central in the city of Boston. First was sort of a Jewish neighborhood and people migrated to other towns in, in Boston like Brookline and other, um, Newton and other places. And there was social housing and social projects that brought um, a lot of African-American population into Grove Hall. Today is an incredibly diverse um, neighborhood with Jamaicans, Cape Verdeans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Cubans. It's, it's a really incredibly diverse um, place. Um, the place, the, the location of these particular projects over the Mesa karaoke, pro, uh, karaoke politics was um, in a very central area of the neighborhood, but at the same time a vacant area. It had been a, a common um, um, ground, like a, a park in the past, um, and is today used part of it as a parking lot, and then it's just a bike vacant site and an um, abandoned basketball court. Uh, but this is in front of the public library, in front of the high school, the public high school um, um, neighborhood, neighbor, uh, neighbor to a, a commercial site, like the central commercial site of the neighborhood. So it's a pretty transited space and also a church. 
um, when I was invited to uh, create the, pub the public art project, um, which I ha was created in the context of the Now and There um, Accelerator for Public Art program, and I uh, thank you to them for my first public art project, um, this site became really important to me. It was a contested site um, in terms of its function in the, in the neighborhood. Um, but at the same time, it was an abandoned site. I think part of it because of the conflicts that it generated, like it needed to serve different populations. Um, and the other conflict that I had as an artist was how do I come into a neighborhood that I don't live in and pretend to bring something that is gonna feel some kind of need without being part of the community. So I decided to work from my own personal subjectivity as an immigrant, um, Latin American immigrant and bring something that I could share. Um, and I decided to think about um, cultural migrations and the, the migration of cultural practices. And in particular, I decided to work with Sobremesa, which is a practice you know, inherited from the Sp Spanish colonizers in Latin America, but completely digested by all the different cultures. Um, now the different, um, which is basically the practice of staying at a table after a meal for hours on end, um, where like, you know, coffee mixes with wine and the plates are not taken out and there's a kind of accumulation of objects and a metaphorical accumulation of memories and, you know, difficult subject matters are treated. Usually there's this kind of social contract where um, you can, you have agency, you will share difficult things and there's the kind of this social contract where we'll be, we agree to be vulnerable together um, and resolve certain conflicts or whatever happens we won't carry out um, later. And so I decided to bring this concept and share it, uh, thinking of like what Sam was just saying, being together and congregating and realizing that we're basically all humans. Um, and the other thing is that recently before the project, I had experienced karaoke for the first time and um, realized that that was another instance where they get, there's a social contract of um, agreed vulnerability and also agreement of failing in public while being taken care of by others. So the idea of creating, generating a space to be vulnerable together was like, I think at the center of um, this project and the idea of practicing resistance through vulnerability also was something that really interests me. So I brought a ton of tables together, um, dining tables, we per like, you know, old dining tables, we purpose them, we um, stain them. You're seeing in the image, um, a project drawing, the maquette and an image um, of the um, closing event. Um, my idea was to stain the tables all to look different so that each table became a, a sort of territory. So the bodies that would be on top of the tables would you know, be constantly negotiating different areas and kind of thinking of a, as a political map. Um, and of course, also kind of challenge the, the, the concept, like you know, bring the literal translation of sobremesa, which it means on top of the table, to have actual bodies on top of the table and generate, you know, a challenge to habitual expectations to put you in your body and in that moment and be super present in the in the activity. So um, we did a ton of different events. The other thing that was important, um, I'm sorry, is, is was to like the idea of sharing authorship. So in a way, I'm putting to get, I'm presenting a project that. I just created the platform, but whatever happened there during those two months was not mine at all. Um, I shared the cultural practice, match it with another cultural practice, kind of looking at um, celebrating difference, but then people used it, right? And so we had um, two events. One was a karaoke event to um, open the piece, which was a surprise. Um, we had, a lot of people dancing on top of the tables, people sharing different music. Um, the church, neighbor church, came, the people attending the church came to participate as well. And what was interesting is that my hope for like a celebration of diversity and kind of the negotiation of difference started to happen as soon as we opened the, the microphone where we had, um, it, I think the next image can show you. Um, Camila was, just coming from Puerto Rico to live in the Boston area and decided to share uh, an a cappella song of resistance, uh, Puerto Rican, but at the same time we had like John Denver or we had like other music from um, uh, South America being shared. So like this became um, what I was expecting that sort of celebration of hybridism. 
Um, and as the project progressed, we had, uh, you know, from chess playing on top of the tables to taiko drumming, line dancing, um, spoken word, and also complications with, um, you know, um, the stakeholders of the site and the neighborhood. Um, today, the site's still contested, and um, they're not clear decisions of how the, the site is going to evolve, if it's going to become a park or not. But it's a, I think it's very, very symptomatic of where we are in terms of like trying to um, understand positions and context. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you all. I'm gonna ask that Meg, our um, behind the scenes helper, is gonna unmute and show each of the artists. I have to say, um, hearing each of you speak induces in me a lot of longing just to be with other people, seeing how each of you are working on a scale in which you actually bring people together and you're talking about geographies and spatial dynamics. I think that so much about that. Um, resonates now and it's quite beautiful the way that you're solving that Sonia in the development of a of the Solidarity Brook project that seeks to create a community in a dispersed at a just time in which we cannot gather um, so I just appreciate the span of your approaches um, I think that what you've offered is a kind of master class in how artists can confront social justice and acknowledge institutional um, Weight, uh, context and to challenge them and actually to bring them to the fore. Um, I think that there's so many questions I think we want to ask. I think we can talk to about each other. I think I wanted to actually address our current moment, the elephant in the room, which is how we talk about not only in the, in the context of a pandemic, but the recent protests and the rise of many different movements over the summer in particular since the spring um, that we are a part of a period of a cultural reckoning and I wanted to just um, bring that bring that phrase up do you given that each of you have worked on these subjects for so many years um, and you've lived through them in different phases of your career and also personally do you feel do you recognize that that we are in this moment right now and how do you contact how do you connect that to um, the work that you're making now so this idea of um, a climax in a way and a time at which we are being called to action in this moment. Well, do, do you want us to answer in the same order that we spoke? I want to say that um, engine for art, democracy and justice was a, a specific response to our time. It was yeah. about how do we reach, a, how do we continue uh, to have a conversation in a dialogue in a time in which we are uh, physically separated. And we, we is, the, way, the way that that was a structure was eight episodes with three fundamental topics, uh, four topics. The first topic was called redefining monuments. So it was two conversations focused by a number of very important people working in the question of monument about monumentality. The second was uh, emerging solidarities. So what it means, what is the contextualization for solidarities in our circumstances and worldwide and what this means. And then we, made, we went to the body and his social performativity. And then uh, the last topic was love transmutation. But monument, we have there a, Caroline Randall Williams with a wonderful text about, do you want a monument? My body is a confederate monument, as she being the daughter, the granddaughter of a confederate general in, in, in Nashville. And we're going to uh, solidarity and it's about how do we move and how do we as artists foster solidarity between an we seen institutional frames who has posed us to be competitors with each other. The history of the institutional frame of visuality in the art is the very top, the one, the two, 
and disen disen disenfranchise in a way the connectivity and the lines of when the artists care, support, and embrace each other. So it was a big conversation about that when we, the artists, take the helm and in between us, we create a dynamic of conversation, dynamic of truth, dynamic of support, dynamic of care that is, that is in there. Performativity of the body because for the first time in pandemic, the entire world and the nation was exposed to a public execution that nobody said that they couldn't see it because George Floyd was assassinated in a slow motion publicly. Everybody, I don't have a TV, but I saw a lady. Everybody saw that and love transmutation because from my perspective, from my practice, I believe that the only thing, the only thing that will save us moving future is the redeeming quality of love besides and beyond all the polluted, all the polluted social engagement and social structure that we are in and that we have been, and, and that is part of the um, every traditional language that we have uh, used. I, wonder, I think that, and it connects actually to what Sonia has talked about. And I wondered, Sonia, if you could remark on your conception of the Solidarity, Solidarity Project. Was it something you started in this time or is it something you'd long been planning and now it's even, and you had to evolve it to the conditions of where we are? Um, yeah, so um, thank you. And thank you, Maga, for your, and everybody just, uh, just love this group of people. Um, I wish we were together. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, so the Solidarity Book Project actually started in this moment um, as we are separated through the pandemic and in this pulse point in this nation that has long been in this uh, paradox of freedom for some humans um, with the baked in subjugation of other humans. I mean, that's the nation that we're in. So in this moment where George Floyd's um, lynching uh, is a catalyst, it makes me think about how, um, how, we, how we see each other's humanity. I mean, I, I'm thinking about how Mamie Till brought forth the humanity of Emmett, how um, by saying, I want this image to be seen so people can see their lack of humanity in a way to understand the humanity that, of course, Black and brown people have, right? Um, and how that relates to like Darnella Frazier, you know, to Magda's point. Um, George Floyd could have been killed and many have been killed and no one was there to witness, right? To stand there witness and say, this is not right and I'm going to put this into the world. And, you know, so I guess there's part of this thing that I do think about often that is, um, this is a chapter in a long history in this nation um, and it is a reckoning again and again and again. And I think about Ella Baker's, you know, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. But I also think that that's not individuals cannot rest because of course we have to rest to gear up for what we have to do next. So we have to be vigilant together. And this is where the solidarity comes. Again, if Darnella wasn't there, we wouldn't know about George Floyd's death, right? We wouldn't know, right? Um, if Mamie Till didn't say, I want this image of my mutilated son to be in Jet Magazine, we wouldn't know in the same way. And so we have to look at the ugly truths in order to rectify the ugliness of the history of this nation. Um, sorry, that got off topic in terms of the Solidarity Book Project, but it's those kinds of things. And with the Solidarity Book Project, what I'm really thinking about is how do we find each other's humanity in literature and books and cookbooks and history books and economics books? You know, like how is it that we can 
understand who we are collectively and celebrate that collectively and love each other, as Magda said, so that we can do better collectively. If I, if I may, Sam, am I cutting you? Were you gonna say something? Um, I, I just taking like, um, thank you, Sonia, and thank you, Magda. I was just thinking about like, you know, our position as artists, like we are being asked to have these kind of big, big answers to questions that we have not even been able to formulate yet. But um, talking this morning to some people, I was thinking, well, actually that's why I don't speak or write books. I'm actually a maker and you see making and kind of reflecting and trying to figure out things through the making that I am able to kind of come to some sort of place of understanding. It's, it's, it's sort of like, trying to understand and, and it's usually in that making that we're generating questions. Um, so I think if anything, you know, like how do we, if the question is how do we deal with this thing? I think it's through like, you know, the strategies that we're building to make those pro the projects that, you know, we just presented. Um, and one of the things that I've been discovering lately and I think part of being in this kind of insanity of COVID and social unrest worldwide, because you know, like what we're living here I'm also seeing in Chile back home and it's just not, you know, unraveling everywhere. Um, is the, like, the idea of um, not authoring anything individually, I think goes back to what Magda was saying at the beginning, like the top artist, the one artist, like not like the idea of solidarity and, and an engagement with others, you know, and, and collaboration. And collaboration, I'm seeing more and more and share authorship today as ways of kind of bringing together, sharing that love and sharing responsibility. In share, uh, in share agency, there's shared responsibility and there's awareness of the vulnerability of the other. Um, and I think it, those are really kind of potent places to start generating work today. Um, yeah, I mean, Danielle, I loved how you, you presented that idea of a social contract of, of, of agreed vulnerability that Sobre Mesa relied on, um, that you would um, come to a table and then um, show yourself in some way, in a way that makes yourself, um, you know, that, takes down the barriers and actually helps you feel more connected to those who are also doing the same. Um, Sam, I don't know if you wanted to add as well to, the, to what we're talking about in our current moment, or we can move on to some other comments or questions. Well, I've already forgotten your, I've already forgotten your question. <laughs> well, whatever, you have a response <laughs> coming to mind. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have this. I just experiencing the vulnerability right now. <laughs> So this is a this is something I carried with me from from Tijuana. My friend, the artist Marcos Ramirez, uh, and I just I love this. So I, I always have it in my studio. Uh, yeah, and and I I agree with uh, what um, Danielle and Sonia and, and Magda have expressed, um, and I think we all do our work from that perspective, from the perspective of of love and shared humanity. Doesn't mean it's not tough. It doesn't mean it's not confrontational. It doesn't mean it, it, it hurts people. It gets people upset. Um, sometimes we get hurt. <laughs> I've certainly had that experience. Doing this kind of work is um, you're playing with fire and, and um, it's not easy. It's certainly not for everyone. Um, but I guess it's what we do. We have to do it. And I mean, just in terms of the moment we're in, um, I just have a brief comment and that is, and I think others said it, it's part of a long continuum of struggle. And we didn't get here just like poof, suddenly, wow, um, you know, Black Lives Matter all of a sudden. <laughs> that's part of a struggle that's been going on for centuries. Um, and, and more recently, the hard work that organizers have been doing in the last 10, 20 years to get us to where we are now. So that when the images of George Floyd's brutal murder come forward into the media, there's actually a movement there that can organize and help people to get on the street, help people to put that outrage uh, and that need for change into productive 
um, social action. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that's a little different now is that we have all these different grassroots movements that are poised and ready to channel our dissatisfaction with the status quo into productive action. And I just wanted to say, you know, um, uh, the defund the police um, issue, which is such a big thing now with uh, the, the hand wringing in the Democratic Party. We can't say defund the police. We can't say abolish the police, blah, blah, blah. I mean, just, let's just look at um, uh, Camden, New Jer uh, Camden, New Jersey, the city across from Philadelphia. I would just encourage everyone to go check out Camden, New Jersey Police Department. Just Google that. look at it <laughs> yeah see what they did they do they're doing really well without very many police yeah. Sonia, did you want to i i saw you open your mouth and oh i have so many things to say um <laughs> you know, i have so many things to say um uh one one of them is i just want to reiterate you see the pulse point in all of our work is this um this idea of collaboration and and just to reiterate something that Daniela said and that is, um, is pulsing through all of our work is that it's through collaboration that I become a better artist. It's like constant critique of the work and building of the work, which is why I made this um, comparison between showing a, a brand new project that I don't actually know what it will become, you know, and saying that it's like a newborn and we're raising it together. Um, and so that project changes with my team, you know, things about it morph and change. And um, I have to step aside and let it be and embrace it. And I know with my collaborative projects, there's always a starting point, a seed, and then it grows into something that is um, usually beyond what I could ever have conceived by myself. Um, and so it's the privilege of working in community and solidarity. Um, it's a privilege to be an artist and have all those challenges. Um, I wanted to ask or pivot the conversation a little bit into the topic of world building. So we talk about institutions and the need to, we are critiquing them. Many of us are involved in different ways in which to enforce change and ensure change from within. But given the opportunity, if you had the opportunity to start an entirely new arts organization, a new school, a new kind of residency, or even a type of um, program that doesn't yet have a name, what would this kind of place look like? Um, how might it be organized? What are, what are examples that you admire or know of already um, that you might share with the audience? Because I think we're all looking for um, new ways of thinking. And I think among you already, you are world, world builders. Clearly, Magda, you are the the queen of that. <laughs> um, and so I'm just curious what, what, you, what you all look to as models, institutional models or other types. Uh, to start, I, say, I, I choose these three projects because um, they, they show not only a, a, consistent, a consistency with idea, but a, a frame of time. We are talking about a project from 2003 and the last project is 2020. So it's a continuum there. But um, the question, the fundamental question always is, uh, I would say, uh, what about if? <laughs> the first thing is, what about if, if the artist is uh, there, you know, uh, to, to, to step out of the shoes that is predictable assigned assign to itself, itself or herself or themselves. Uh, and I am thinking, I want to put as an example, not only AADAJ, who brought, we brought some of the most important or more vivid, to say it that way, artists working today to be accessible to an audience of students any place in the world. You don't need it to be a Vanderbilt to listen to, to, to Siesta Gates and Karime Wins and Okuyo Pocahuasile. You could be any place in the planet. And we have a student listening in Havana, Cuba, and a student listening in Ghana. And, uh, and, and this is part of using this space of a, a new media and whatever good or bad the new media has. But also the Biennial of Matanzas, uh, Intermittent Rivers, was a completely new uh, format of a Biennial. Once, we didn't have money from anybody. We didn't have sponsors. I invite my artist friends, not all of them, but the many that I could. They pay for their ticket to go to Cuba. They ship their work to go to Cuba. Uh, a group of friends in Cuba cook and fed them carefully 
nicely so nobody have a stomach pain, uh, bad water in the Caribbean. And so uh, in the end, and we work with the neighborhoods as part of rebuilding scene that we wanted to do. It was labeled the Biennale of Love. It was choose as one of the 15 um, important projects in the world that year. But what is was there, what is there that is new was a back to solidarity, back to trust, back, back to caring. And, and also what I believe, the building up over time, a certain rapport and trust with the group of people who are going to follow you to good destination or terrible destinations. So I am thinking in that model as the model that when I am starting EADJ in, uh, in Abandeville is the same. It's the first seat for a grad program. It's the first seat for a grad program for the arts in which in a conversation, in a seminar, you have an archeologist, you have an, a, 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 a humanist, you have a doctor, you have a lawyer, and you have an artist talking of the same issue, the, the idea of broken, the idea of repair. And we, and we talk for repair of systematic racism and inequality to repair traditional repair of ceramics in the history of clay work. So, so here is what I think of myself in the, in the, in the possibility of new idea or an institution. I have been, a, 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 I supposed to build an MFA program but I am arguing behind that because I am no interested in another MFA program as the one that I left, that I respect, uh, and the one, the many ones in the country and in the world that I respect. But we need a program that engages the arts and is relation with everything that is affecting us with the new responses. I imagine when I am not around anymore because I am not as young as Daniela or Sonia. Or, 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 you know, so they will be here much longer than me, uh, God permitted. Uh, uh, I imagine a moment in which to be an artist, whatever course success for artists, could be somebody that is working full time with a, with a group of surgeons or with, with robotic people or, or that is in a bank. Or, so the idea of the artist in his, her dance studio as a, is a model that is 19, 20th century, and I think that this is a moment of, that we see it now. And that to conclude this, or I don't talk too much, which I tend to do, and, and what is happened now, now with COVID-19, this extraordinary biological event is the beginning of a transformation that we cannot go back. There is no way back to anything, even with COVID vaccine. We already have been marked, affected, eh, eh, inscribed uh, with something that is our own progress, our own moving forward. And with that, what is art, how it's taught, how it's exhibited, how it's represented, it needs to change. It's nothing that could hold that back. And that is what I am as a mature professor in some way um, struggling. I don't have answers, but I am open many questions. I, I, I second that. I, I struggle with the idea of hierarchies within the institutions. You know, what would be if an institution would rotate their roles constantly? Like one day the student is the professor and the professor is the student. Like, like we are so kind of in these worlds of hierarchies, right? Like, you know, that we don't understand positions or positionality. And I think that's part of like, you know, the idea, also the idea of collaboration and sharing expertise rather than like, you know, we're talking about interdisciplinarity constantly, but we don't have the, the width band to like do that, bring all of those voices to the same table, have all of those expertises kind of be sharing in the, in, the inter, in the exchange of information and celebrate that difference rather than like trying to create this homogeneous, you know, um, way of thinking. I think I, I personally would love a rotation in roles where the powers are exchanged, you know, like a totally new topic. Um, but I think there could be some seed for understanding and share and share responsibilities there. Daniela, I feel you there. I, um, I, I love the idea of flattening hierarchies. There's so many hierarchies that in, are inherent in our art institutions. I mean, when I read this question, I thought, well, first of all, are we talking about the built environment? Because that's already a problem. 
Like on what land, who's the architect, what's the space? Is it built to look monumental? What does it mean to be a monument? What does that do? Who gets to belong? Who doesn't get to belong? And at the heart of that is this question about what does it mean to belong? Like the, to me, the sense of, um, the sense of a kind of utopian sense of freedom means that, um, well, to, to quote Nina Simone, like freedom means no fear, right? But it also means to belong, right? So what does it truly mean to belong? And I'm gonna give a, a quick example of, um, maybe, not, maybe not the most useful example, but um, two times in my career, I have had museums purchase um, objects that were made in my studio with many hands of my studio assistants, but with my name on them. And these objects were purchased by the community. And I mean by the community. So not, um, not some um, wealthy board member who wrote a check, but the community. And so one of these, one of these artworks ended up at the Blanton Museum at the University of Texas, Austin. And I had um, people coming up to me saying, I bought your artwork and put it in the museum, like from little people to engineers. To, and it just, it felt completely different than when muse, public museums say, oh, this belongs to you. And it's like, does it, you know? But if we took that one step further, that means if the museum ever sold that piece, then everybody should get some profit from it. Right? <laughs> I mean, like everybody who invested should get some profit. Because in that example, all the people who gave to that piece, their names are on the placard by the piece. So their names are in the museum. So it also brings in this like the sense of, it's such a, maybe it's just a trivial example of what it means to belong in a space and to diminish hierarchies because the names weren't listed by who gave the most money and the least money. Everybody's name was listed. Um, and I felt like I belonged to that community through that artwork, even though it wasn't a collaborative project, it ended up having this sense of collaboration. But again, this notion of what does it mean to belong? And then I also think about like who holds the story of physical objects? Because in that example, the story of that physical object now belongs to all of the people in a different way, right? Um, I have much to say about this. Big questions, big questions. <laughs> I, I, um... I think that uh, it's hard to imagine making a new institution within a system that's so unequal and unjust um, and doesn't work. The status quo doesn't work. And I think rather than trying to imagine a utopian alternative, we need to have a kind of national uh, reckoning and conversation about our, our priorities as a, a society. Because we have a lot of great institutions, they just aren't functioning the way they should. And I've been teaching at CalArts for 25 years and I've been working <laughs> all that time to try and make CalArts into a more diverse, inclusive place, to hire faculty of color, to hire faculty who teach from a post-colonial perspective, from a perspective of justice. Um, that is a brutal, thankless struggle. Mostly people hate you and you don't get anywhere um, <laughs> until suddenly something happens. We had that happen at CalArts a couple of years ago where we had a faculty search. Suddenly, after all those years of doing work and losing every battle, suddenly we hired two African-American women. And it felt to me like, oh my God, what happened? It was, took me totally by surprise. But again, it's that work. You've got to work and work and work and work for years inside your institution to change it. And until we change that, like we've been talking about hierarchy, we need to change the top level of the hierarchy. And in order to create equality and diversity through an institution, it has to start at the top. Of course, pressure from the bottom has to be there. But the people at the top can resist that pressure, particularly in an educational institution because students come and go. So it's gotta be the leadership. The top person has to say, you know what? We are gonna make this college, university program, whatever, look like America. 
and that's going to be our priority. And that, and then they will hire the people that should be hired. And I, you know, I mean, basically, I'm, I'm, I, I think, while it's very well meaning, all of these, you know, programs for racial sensitivity and diversity and inclusion, they're nice, but they actually don't really work. And the social science shows that they don't. Um, we need, if we're going to change our institutions, it has to be done on a structural level from the top down. Um, and I think, you know, that includes money. Money is the big thing. And, you know, we used to have a really robust, vital um, uh, art scene that had nonprofit art spaces. It had university galleries that showed uh, work that couldn't make it in the commercial realm. Those have all been killed because of all of our... Um, regressive taxation policies. There's no money for those things. So we put all our money as a society into the wrong things. We're putting all this debt, we're putting all our students into debt, they're getting out of college with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Uh, this country, I mean, I'm in Germany, <laughs> I can't say that, but the US is in an emergency situation. Uh, it is so dire on every level. I just, I can't even think about alternatives. I mean, the country's on the edge of collapse. It really it, is. And it the is pandemic the of, makes it worse. I mean, we have, we have, I think the pandemic is the perfect example and the perfect mirror for the society we have right now, right? Who gets to, who gets to be cure of COVID and who, who gets access to a treatment who doesn't? Who are the people that are dying of these disease? I, I think some, sorry to interrupt, but yes, we are at the edge, verge of collapse. And yeah, it, it, requires, <laughs> it requires a complete structural change, right? But, but seriously, so. we need public health. Let's just start there. And, and you can access to education for all. Like that's, those are the things that would actually really, really generate social mobility and would al allow us to have more social justice. You know, I can make a ton of soda mesa projects. I can put them all over the place. And the only thing I'm going to do is just a little bit more visibility, but it's going to do nothing. I, could I disagree with, could I disagree just with the last phrase, Daniel, which is a belief that it does something. And I, and I want to, I want to say uh, Sam and everyone that have talked before, I, I happen to be an optimistic and I happen to, you know, love. I believe in love transmutation and the power of love and the power of our and, and the power of our shared humanity. So I, I hold into love, uh, you know, love as, as Bell would say, that is action, you know. So I, in my words here, I am trying to push, you know, and express my own trust and belief in love. But two things that I found that is fundamental at this moment in America. And uh, for instance, the conversation on truth. Uh, and I want to bring that to the metaphor of art. Art is an imaginary, always. Art is the alternative reality, always. We, we work with whimsicality, always. There is something that is the realm of the real in which we born and die. And art have an after and before life of all of that. And it held in that kind of romanticism and that incredible uh, flexibility of its nuances. When you live in a society in which lies, constant lies are accepted as truth, you are eroding fundamental issues about the perception and the validity of yeah. knowledge. And we are talking about, we need, we need to educate there is a fundamental problem of uh, ethics of education, ethics of understanding and acceptance of truth. And then uh, it's almost like we live in a reality in which reality doesn't count. This is a problematic thing. This is a fundamental thing. And that is, an, and that is an, a structure. The new form of oppression that I observe as a, as a artist, as a consumer of art, is the negation of truth and the imposition of lies as the new truth. That is a problem. That Can is I a fundamental problem because it erodes anything in which we could stand for certainty. Somebody could tell me now that this conversation that I have in here now is not true. And I know that could happen. And that's a matter that I spoke. So yeah. that for me is a fundamental thing of access to knowledge 
and, as, and access to metaphor of knowledge in what art resides. I agree. I agree. But also in, in terms of the education, and I think one of the things that is happening in institutions in general, education institutions, is the lack of contextualization of the information we're providing, which is another truth that is missing, you know, in the, in the, in, in the um, spread of information. Contextualization, constant contextualization as an act of like anti-racist act, you know. No, it's not just access to education, it's access to the context of where education has kind of uh, was has been built. That's so another that's another, so that's so another I want to have a conversation and perdon for that. I want I am desperate to be in a conversation with who? Elon Musk. <laughs> he's um he's you know, the artist he's texas you can find him in texas now um we we unfortunately really have to close our our conversation just as things are going deeper and i i we all I probably knew this would happen um i want to thank you all so much for giving your time and thoughts and speaking about things that feel unresolved and also very um very heated and so i just really I really appreciate all of your time. Um, we would love to do this again. I know I can see in the comments that people want phase two, so I know. <laughs> um, but but for the time being, I just want to say thank you to each of you. And if anyone has a final word they wanted to add to the conversation, um, please please speak up now, and we'll we'll say goodbye to all of you who joined us. Thank you all, hundreds of you, from joining. I I would I would like to just say thanks to the Rappaport Foundation. I think they um, the work they're doing is an example of a of a really ethical foundation and institution that's um, doing a lot you know doing this wonderful conversation, but doing a lot more all over the place in healthcare and so forth. So, thank you. Thank you. I second that. I'm grateful to all of you, and I I just want to collaborate with all of you and do something <laughs> together. I feel like there's the power of artists is that we are in fact visionaries. We can see the future, you know? I feel like if you can visualize it, you can make it happen. Um, and so that is my optimism wrapped in a pessimistic outside, <laughs> optimistic core um, that I can imagine a space of belonging and a space of freedom. I don't have a choice. I have to imagine that as a black woman in the United States of America. I have to imagine that. But I have to hold that one. in my heart. It has to be my optimism. And I can't let anyone take the truth of that reality away from me, that mm -hmm. possibility away from That's me. Beautiful. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you all. We're going to sign off now. And, um, thanks, Sarah. Great to lose you. But <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. Bye. And thanks to our audience, too. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Thank Bye. you.